preface rather than the talk right now. Before I get into the talk and make a few comments. Okay. Um, this was the second talk I ever gave uh, on this general topic of war in the military. And it was uh, done in uh, February of 2007. And as I mentioned before, since then I've given about 30 talks on the topic. Um, this talk was originally uh, about two hours because I had my own time at the then. But I've pared it down quite a bit. Uh, so it'll, it'll be an hour and 55 minutes. No, wow. kidding. Um, <laughs> I'm going to go through it pretty fast because it's like a summary. And it, it's, I would say this particular talk is designed to make an impact rather than, uh, how shall I say, uh, a lot of detail. Because what I'm going to cover is about 150 years and thousands of military revolts. Okay, so I have to go through it pretty fast and not cover it all. If you are really interested in the topic, that's why I gave you this bibliography on military and workers insurgencies. Um, these books, uh, most of them, you can get them at life, all of them you get at libraries. Uh, I've indicated with asterisks the ones you can find cheaply online. One of them, this one here, the Bolsheviks and uh, Armed Forces and Three Revolutions. That is in this library upstairs in the Russian section. So I think that's enough to preface this. OK, well, welcome to the Marxist Library, Sunday morning project of the Institute for the Critical Study of Society. You've all been here before, and you all know Al. Our usual procedure is to hold your questions until he delivers his lecture, and then we will pause for station identification and um, fundraising, and then proceed to questions. And you'll handle your own questions, answer? Yeah. OK. So I've been handling my own answers. <laughs> OK. All right, it's all yours. OK. So the first of this series of talks was on Engels as a revolutionary warrior. The second is on the military uh, and war thought of Engels as applied to military resistance struggles and people's movements. The uh, previous lecture established the importance of Engels' military thought to his life's work. And not only was Engels a uh, detailed uh, analyst of war in the military, he was a combat veteran. Uh, his goals as a revolutionary warrior was to present the working class with the tools of military and war theory and practice that they needed to adopt in appropriate circumstances to make the socialist revolution. Um, one of Engels' emphasis was on military insurrection uh, in support of workers' revolutionary struggles. But for this to occur required an engagement of the working class movement with military workers in uniform. And quotes around that, workers in uniform. Of course, in the modern period, uh, much less in the pre-1800s, not all military resistance was a result of the relationship between the workers' movement and uh, the military. Uh, in the absence of the working class movement, uh, military mutinies occurred for various reasons, um, most frequently because of uh, abominable working conditions, uh, bad treatment by officers, and being asked to fight in situations that they thought were senseless or without justification. Uh, the examples that I'm going to look at uh, today uh, is going to focus on those in which the working class movements played a role, although in some cases uh, 
we, uh, you know, I'll uh, speak without reference to the working class movement, and that's in a minority of cases. I'm going to uh, briefly concer uh, concern myself with examples of military resistance in Europe and the United States from the 1800s to the 21st century. And of course, this cuts out a large uh, part of the world in a long period of time, but for the purpose of uh, this uh, presentation, uh, that's just going to have to be necessary. First, Europe. Historically, naval rather than military mutinies have been more frequent in Europe because the ship was a self-contained unit which reflected the hierarchy of the wider society, although in a more extreme form. The ship gave mutineers a limited space to take control and their officers had no place to hide. Uh, in fact, the word strike comes from the practice of striking the sails, that is, lowering the sails so that the mutineers could literally shut down their factory or ship. In the British Navy, one of the first attempts uh, to uh, halt such revolts was the creation of the British Royal Marines. Uh, they were detailed to each ship to put down any uprising by force of arms. While army revolts began to take precedent in the late 1800s, early 1900s, naval revolts extended throughout the 20th century, especially in the golden age of military revolts from the 1860s to the 1930s. It was a golden age, not only because the military insurgencies increased, but also they were more frequently related to workers' revolts and revolutions In the 20th century, one only need to uh, examine the Russian revolutions of 1905 uh, and 1917 to see the crucial role of the army and navy uh, that was played in, in them. As we might already know, and is detailed in this book, upstairs in the library to remind you, uh, that uh, the Bolsheviks, and this doesn't mention also the Mensheviks, uh, had units from 1905 all the way through uh, November 17 in the military. Uh, there were not only Bolsheviks and Mensheviks in the military at the time, there were special units of the parties which would relate to them. Uh, this was called Voyenskas. Okay, Voyenskas, military organizing. But it occurred not just among the uh, uh, Russian military, but also there are ex other examples. For example, uh, in the Black Sea, French, in the Black Sea, uh, French sailors literally took over several battleships and cruisers and turned them back to France rather than to be used against the Bolsheviks. Um, what year was that? What? What year was that? Uh, that was, I believe, in seven. It was either seventeen or eighteen. I forget. But it was in a real, yeah, in yeah. seventeen or eighteen. Um, <coughs> the uh, leaders of of the French insurrections. Uh, those who were those who were most class conscious and were sailors of working class origin who worked in the engine rooms and who had either been socialists or anarchists or influenced by them. When the sailors took over the ships, they would raise the red flag and assemble on deck and sing the Internationale as they uh, turned back the ships to France. It had been quite a movie, incidentally, if they made the one. Uh, of course, as with the case of most uh, revolts, successful or otherwise, the leaders were court-martialed, dismissed from the Navy, spent up to 20 years in a hellhole prison in Corsica, which was uh, reputedly as bad as uh, Devil's Island, which was in French Guyana at the time. Um, some people have asked me, what's the difference between organizing in the factory and organizing in the military? In a factory, you're less likely to be uh, sent to jail 
or killed the military more frequently that happens but kind of getting ahead of myself I want to go back to the mid 18 uh, hundreds in the early 1900s at Europe at this in Europe at this time the labor movement was picking up steam and demonstrations workers strikes and general strikes were frequent not to mention uprisings like the uh, Paris Commune uh, though there were many uh, lesser known large-scale rebellions all over Europe All over Europe, but such activities were b brutally repressed by the police and the army, resulting in the deaths and injuries of literally tens of thousands. The response of different countries varied, with the severest repressions mostly occurring in the democratic republics, with the exception, of course, of Russia. By the late 1880s, European left groups, primarily socialists, uh, who were in the internet, Second International and the anarchists began to develop countermeasures to this, uh, the attacks on uh, the uh, labor movement. Uh, and these countermeasures were designed to deal with the military attacks on labor. Most European countries conscripted uh, soldiers, which made it easier for working class parties to organize within the military. Special uh, Socialist Party units were designated for military work both uh, from inside and outside the military. Almost all party uh, youth groups had military organizing as one of the chief tasks. Youth who were drafted formed socialist groups in the military which worked in conjunction with civilian socialist party groups designed for military organizing activities. Leaflets, books, counter-military manuals, and even, quote, GI newspapers were targeted to soldiers or persons who got their orders to report for the draft. Meeting spaces outside military bases, oftentimes, oftentimes pubs owned by socialists uh, party members or sympathizers were used as places for political discussion with soldiers, uh, much akin to the uh, GI coffee houses during the uh, Vietnam War. I might add parenthetically that um, the uh, Vietnam uh, anti-war soldiers and vets eventually uh, used uh, tactics from a trial and error or, ex or exper experiment approach, rather than from reading all the uh, history of Marxist organizing within the military. It would have saved them time and a lot of mistakes if they understood what had happened before and what worked and what didn't work in certain circumstances. Uh, the results of um, these uh, late 1800 uh, activities were mixed. In a couple of countries, um, they were quite effective. In most, the impact was limited. The example of success was Belgium, which experienced uh, military attacks on workers repeatedly and savagely. The turning point was in 1902, after 16 years of military organizing by socialist soldiers. Yeah, let me say that again, after 16 years, right? The United States has never seen that amount of, for, in terms of length of military organizing. The regular army and uh, reservists refused to be used against workers as well as refused to be deployed to the colonies. The government got around this by using police against workers and creating a special paramilitary force for use in their colonies. More typical cases were France or Switzerland, where selective rather than blanket military refusals occurred. In those cases, some countries did not attack workers, pardon me, some units did not attack workers, 
while other units did. Uh, for example, the situation of refusals got so um, great in Switzerland at the turn of the 19th and 20th centuries, uh, the government felt that uh, militiamen, for the most part, were unreliable to be turned against the workers, so that they took away their rifle bullets, although the Swiss uh, militia army still retained the weapons in their home. They still retain their weapons in their home today with their bullets. While results were varied between uh, military organizing in different European countries, the, um, uh, so were the degree to which socialist and anarchist forces concentrated on organizing within the military. A few countries like England and the US neglected it altogether or only paid it lip service. Others like France, Belgium, and Germany made it one of their major priorities. Most countries gave it less priority with consequently fewer resources. Throughout the late 1800s, early 1900s, there were debates over the political cost effectiveness of military organizing. And there were all the usual polemics, that is, uh, polemics and splits over the necessity for organizing the military over its methods, its goals, over support for individual refusers, refusers versus concentrating on building a mass military movement. Whether the focus should be on conscription refusal or soldiers resistance, on, 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 on. These debates obviously occurred in the United States in the post, in, you know, during Vietnam and after. The basic, in Europe at that time, the basic division was between the anarchists and the socialists. The anarchists focused on individual uh, refusals, like getting uh, draftees to refuse to go in, getting people in the military to desert, okay? Whereas the socialists concentrated on building a mass soldiers' movement within the military. But the response of the capitalist state was not so inconsistent among the different countries. All the capitalist states eventually made military organizing by the left one of their leading priorities to crush. Harsh punishments were meted out to those who wrote, distributed, or recited propaganda to the troops. Soldiers refusing to obey orders were court-martialed, discharged, and jailed. Civilian supporters also faced jail time. Aside from all the internal squabbles within the socialist and anarchist forces regarding military organizing, the state-initiated repression was a definite factor in obstructing the effectiveness of military organizing. Now fast forward to World War I. Here we find mass mobilizations into the military and in some armies such as the British the first large infusion of the industrial working class into the infantry. Many had been active in trade unions and used to class struggles. They entered the, quote, old British army, which was composed of bourgeois officers and enlisted men from rural and small town backgrounds uh, who prior to enlistment were mostly in menial, casual, or even lumpen occupations. There was an almost instant conflict with riots, strikes, political protests, mutinies, insubordination, and other forms of resistance in England, on the continent, and in the colonies. This was set off, among other factors, by the harsh discipline and rigid unquestioning subordination expected of the troops. Soldiers commented that it was worse than on the factory floor and they applied the skills that they had acquired in factory organizing to their military situations. The little known history of this uh, conflagration, which involved thousands of, of troops over the course of the war, can be read in a book, which I did not put on the short list here to read, and that book is called The Unown Unknown Army, uh, Mutinies in the British Army in World War I by Dallas and Gill. It's published by Verso in 1985. Of course, more is known about the fraternization between the... Uh, oh, I mentioned one other 
thing. I get to that. And that briefly is the French army revolts, uh, which were far more devastating than, than among the British. Uh, these revolts were in 1917. Uh, they were, they encompassed 80% of infantry divisions, 40% of all divisions, and um, uh, at one time, the French had only two totally reliable divisions that they could count on. That's a whole other history, but I just wanted to, to mention it to show you the, uh, the large scale of revolts during the war. Um, Which war have we gotten to that that was happening in? World War One. Um, more is known about the uh, conference, more about blah, 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 about the fraternizations between the French, British, and German troops, starting as early as the first year of the war with the so-called Christmas truce, which has gotten a lot of PR, including a couple of movies. Um, in certain conditions, these fraternizations occurred throughout the war, culminating. Uh, in those in which the German, with the Germans and the Russians just prior to, 19, to the 1917 revolution, as well as with the Germans and their opponents in the last days of the war. Uh, surely I think you're familiar with the role of military resistance in ending the war in Germany and also in creating uh, workers and soldiers, uh, Soviets, in Germany, Hungary, Austria, Estonia, Poland, China, and other countries in the period after, the uh, revolutionary period after the Russian Revolution. Um, there is an excellent book, which is on the list here, uh, called uh, do, 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 Armed Insurrection by A. Neuburg. Okay, which details these. Also upstairs in the um, uh, uh, archives, uh, I found uh, a lot of packed issues of the Communist International uh, Journal, which details many of these revolts. Uh, many of the revolts were like in Poland and Austria and other Croatia and other places that occurred in the 1920s are virtually unknown among the left but were very important uh, at, at that time. The main lesson of all these revolts of the 20s and these were all primarily workers armed insurrections the main lesson was how prepared, how, pardon me, how unprepared these workers' armies were in terms of strategy, tactics, weapons, preparation, timing, popular support, winning uh, over the troops, and their political objectives. Most were initially defeated, and the few that gained initial success were later defeated. Survivors who continued on learn their lessons, achieving eventual victories in, not in Europe, except for a couple of cases, but in Vietnam and China. In the, the couple of cases in Europe where they learned their lessons were in uh, Yugoslavia and Albania. I might add that the, uh, the Communist International also uh, had military organizing as one of its uh, uh, goals and had units within the Communist International that were designed to organize within the, within the military. Uh, these were not <clears throat> all that successful. One of the reasons was because many of their unit, uh, many, pardon me, many of the countries did not follow suit or many of the Communist parties did not follow suit. Uh, uh, the one of the few that was um, 
uh, successful uh, was in the Japanese Communist Party, which did organize contingents uh, within the Japanese army, particularly in Manchuria. When uh, these uh, uh, units uh, made themselves felt when they tried to organize revolts or organize resistance to certain orders, they of course met the common fate. They were shot. Okay, so much for the golden years. Not that the post-golden years uh, uh, didn't have effects which occurred, occurred down to the present. There were instances of military resistance around certain issues to varying degrees among European armies and their colonial troops up through World War II and in the period of uh, decolonialization from 45 to 75. Also, uh, there were some successes in organizing, uh, uh, primarily in Europe, in organizing soldiers' unions or soldiers' committees, which functioned as unions. Most of these were originated in the late 60s through the early 80s, although some went back to uh, 1919 to 1921, uh, for example, in the Austrian army. But um, they do continue today. Uh, and like I say, about half of the European armies are, now have unions. Probably the most effective from the uh, Marxist viewpoint uh, is Portugal. There, the Communist Party have a lot of influence in the trade union confederation. Okay, and that trade union confederation, of course, is the one that's, to which military unions are affiliated. And I'll give you a, just a couple of quick examples. A uh, couple of years back, what, about four or five years back during the anti-austerity movement in Portugal, okay, the sergeant's union came out with a statement that said, if the government uses the police to attack the anti-austerity marchers, we will step in and prevent them from doing so. Right? And the ideal thing, the military steps in to stop the capitalists from attacking workers. Okay? Not only that, but you saw among the anti-austerity marchers, there were soldiers in uniforms that were marching with them. Okay? Now let me dwell on some things of the U.S. experience. The first U.S. quote military resistance was in the post-colonial period uh, and continued on into the 21st century. Uh, as you recall, there was skepticism uh, in the uh, original, you know, like in the Constitution among the founders about professional standing armies and their separation from civil societies. And the militias, which is from last uh, time, uh, you might recall, was Engel, uh, Engels used the term armed nation for militias. And the militias were the first real post-revolutionary war army. The Carlisle riot, Shays Rebellion, Whiskey Rebellion, Opposition to Alien and Sedition Acts, Fry's Rebellion, the Siege at Fort Rittenhouse provided some early examples of local militias refusing to obey state and federal laws and at time confronting state level militias in battle. Um, again, a good account is in this, do have it here, yeah. Well-regulated militia by Saul Cornwall details a lot of this stuff. Um, in the Reconstruction period, there were also state militias composed of ex-slaves, which were one of the reasons for the uh, rise of the KKK. 
Uh, I gave a talk about this uh, one time because, uh, again, very little known about uh, the state arming blacks okay, in the South after the war. Right. While socialist parties and labor unions split on the question of militias, there were some workers' militias in the late 1800s and early 1900s. For instance, in Boston, a militia of labor union members was formed, which called itself Our Own Club. There was a hundred year process of militias going from mandatory to voluntary, from basic weapons in citizens' homes to weapons deposited in armories, and from local to state to federal control with the ultimate institutionalization in the National Guard in 1904, which I consider the death of militias in the United States. Uh, over the 1800s, there were, of course, uh, many instances of U.S. military resistance, of which uh, I've really not found a full account, just sporadic instances here and there. Uh, perhaps one of the most detailed accounts, however, was the uh, St. Patrick's Brigade, the San Patricios, in the U.S. war against Mexico in 1848. This outfit, actually not a brigade, uh, but a company, uh, was composed mostly of Irish immigrants who deserted to the Mexican side when, when they saw what U.S. soldiers were doing to churches and clergies in Mexico. They fought the U.S. Army in several engagements, and after the war, most survivors, which were very few, uh, remained in Mexico, perhaps the ancestors of some of today's uh, Pedro O'Briens. During World War I period, the labor movement, Socialist Party, the IWA, took strong anti-militarist stance. However, their work with the military was largely confined to distributing propaganda, urging soldiers not to fight, and for themselves as left, left activists to avoid conscription. Skipping ahead World War II, the closest link between the U.S. working class movement and the uh, military occurred at the end of the war in the demobilization movement, sometimes called the, quote, going home movement. This was in 1945 and 46, when the government wanted to keep the military on duty in the Pacific uh, as a potential to be used, for example, in the case that the Dutch required reinforcements to stem the liberation movement in Indonesia. The GI movement was initiated in the Philippines, but spread all over the Pacific and spread even into Europe. It actively involved literally tens of thousands of military personnel, mass demonstrations, some involving hundreds, others thousands. Mili um, Soldiers' committees, some racially integ integrated, <clears throat> to, uh, to negotiate with the higher level command were founded. Letter writing uh, campaigns to Congress that were coordinated by GI, labor union, and family efforts also occurred. The leaders of this movement included many former trade union officials, especially from the UAW. It also included Communist Party members and members of the Socialist Workers Party. They were successful in forcing the government to alter their plans and to send the troops uh, back home, uh, which was a recognition of the unity <coughs> of these mostly draftees. as well as government helplessness in the face of a disintegrating military machine that refused to go anywhere except back to the U.S. Of perhaps more political significance, this military resistance postponed the Churchill-Truman post-war timetable for mobilizing 
against the national liberation movements in the colonies as well as against the Soviet Union. During World War II, there were several revolts of African American uh, military units and even one Japanese American uh, uh, unit in the Army. The uh, Port Chicago out here, right, refusal is probably the most commented on. Less well known are 